uh, in the first lecture that I, um, that I gave, I tried to indicate how religions have uh, responsibility and have possibility also to shape uh, globalization today. Um, especially I talked about uh, the relationship between uh, Christianity and meaning and uh, pleasure. For me, that was a foundation to think about ways in which, at the personal level, uh, Christian faith uh, can contribute to contentment. Contentment itself, it could be argued, is a condition of possibility of solidarity, including global solidarity that we need today, uh, but also that that contentment is a condition of possibility of taking seriously uh, the damage that we do to the environment so that the ecological as well as broadly social side of things are all intimately intertwined with the question of meaning. It, indeed, as I was teaching this course on religions and globalization at Yale now, for, I was teaching it for about four years, one of the things that became very clear to me is how the largest of all structural questions are tied to the deepest, most intimate desires of our hearts. And I think that connection of the kind of universality, universal and planetary scope, and intensity of concentration upon the desire of the hearts, I think that's what Christian faith, I think, brings to this uh, discussion. And if we let loose of either pole of this discussion, uh, either giving up on the question of desire and dealing simply with structures, global or, or otherwise, I think we lose something. Inversely, if we concentrate simply on the desires, but don't have in view structures of communities and indeed global governance, I think we lose something as well. And this is uh, one of the main uh, thrust of the lectures and of the, my study of the relationship between Christianity and globalization that I find uh, important to, to make. Now in this uh, lecture, I want to inverse the perspective. Instead of looking at how religious faith, how Christian faith can challenge and push globalization processes, maybe hopefully even steer globalization processes, I want to inverse the perspective and ask in what ways have globalization processes shaped uh, the world of uh, religions. Right? So now we think of religions as situated within globalization and the shaping power of globalization. And as you will see, I will try to argue that sometimes this shaping power is to the good of religions, and sometimes it's to the detriment uh, of uh, religions. And roughly the outline of my talk, this um, second talk, is I will speak first about the um, uh, role of globalization in uh, increasing one vitality of religions, and two, the role of globalization in political assertiveness of religions. And finally, uh, in, in last two sections, I will talk about relationship between globalization, state and religions, and then globalization, economy and religions. But before I go into these four sections, growth of religions, political assertiveness of religion, religion and state, religion and economy, I want to say a few words about the kind of character of religious, uh, of religions, nature of global, global religions or world religions. And again, what I will say here, I, I'll identify six features. They will be controversial as just about everything I say <laughs> in these lectures is controversial and there will be people who will push uh, on one or the other of these aspects, maybe on all of them. Um, I think they are useful, and if they're useful to you, that's great. If you can help me refine them, that's fantastic uh, as well. So let's look first, as an int a few introductory comments, about six features of religions. It's important to note that I don't think that these six features are somehow the common core of all religions. They are just what I say they are, I think they're just what I say they are, namely features that we can recognize uh, in those uh, religions. I don't think there is such a thing as essence of religion of which individual religions are some, somehow concrete expressions. I think that each religion 
uh, is a thing in its own, but that they share some common, significant common features. And so here they are, the six common features of world religions. One is that I've already mentioned before. They are two worlds' accounts of reality. I'll try to contrast world religions with uh, local religions in describing these features. So world religions are two worlds' account of reality. Local religions are cosmotheistic. Gods and spirits are aspects of the world itself. World religions have these two worlds, transcendent and mundane. They're not necessarily dualistic, though they can be dualistic, but they're not necessarily dualistic, but they posit two categorically distinct realms, transcendent and mundane, and then relate them positively to each other. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we are deconstructing the world here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I, we need to be involved in the constructive work as well. Let's try that too. <laughs> so these two worlds, as I've indicated earlier, they, they posit a priority of the transcendent, but do not devalue completely uh, ordinary. In fact, they think that ordinary comes to its fully to its own only in relationship to transcendent. <laughs> So that's the first feature. Second feature is human beings are understood as individuals. Local religions, in them devotion is linked to social life of an entire group. People relate to God and spirits as an entire community, as a given sociolinguistic or civic group. World religions essentially, I think, address human beings as individuals. It doesn't mean that they are individualistic. It means that they t address them as individuals and then insert them into a community, transcultural, transnational community. That's partly the reason why they are called world religions. These communities may have locally articulated versions, but fundamentally they are transcultural, transnational. Second, third, World religions make universal claims. Local religions are, well, local. The gods you worship, worship are gods of your people. They're not the gods of some other people. Though it may be possible to translate gods. Jan Asman, Egyptologist from Heidelberg, has written quite a bit about translation within the polytheistic religions. But generally, there are local religions. They're helping local groups to flourish and so forth. World religions make claims to what is true, to what is just for all people, all human beings, irrespective of their cultures. They offer a diagnosis of human predicament. For example, captivity to suffering, that would be in Buddhism maybe, problem of sin, Christianity, lack of guidance, Islam, and they sketch the way out of that for all human beings, irrespective of their culture. Enlightenment, God's unconditional love, or submission to God. Fourth, the good beyond ordinary flourishing. They emphasize the good beyond ordinary flourishing. Now, local religions are connected with ordinary human flourishing. People invoke or placate gods and powers in order to achieve prosperity, health, long life, fertility, to be preserved from disease, from dearth, from sterility, from premature death, all natural ends of human life. World religions are concerned with the good that goes beyond ordinary flourishing. Now, that's, of course, tied with the idea of them having a two-worlds account of reality. There is a transcendent good toward which ordinary relig uh, world religions are oriented. And human beings in world religions can attain their good, even despite languishing in this life. Uh, crucifixion of Jesus Christ 
is a good example. It is part of a good life, so to speak, understood in Christian terms, because it is an act of self-sacrifice on behalf of others. Something very different, but still uh, idea that you can uh, actually flourish despite of uh, lack in this life uh, can be seen in Buddhism as well. Uh, so, fifth feature is that religion is a distinct cultural system. Local religion is kind of ineradicably inscribed in the cultural, institutional, linguistic conditions of a society. They're part and parcel of the society. World religions are, in a sense, autonomous systems. That's going to be a very important feature uh, that I will emphasize uh, later. They're distinct. They're not separate from the other systems, but they're distinct from them. World religions can therefore transcend all political and ethnic bound borders and transplant itself into other cultures. And then the sixth feature is transformation of mundane realities. You recall, again, this is connected with the two worlds account of reality and with the preeminence of transcendent realm over mundane realm. In idea is that you ought to adjust, the mundane realm ought to adjust itself to the character of the transcendent realm. Uh, in biblical terms, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So alignment of the self alignment of communal relations, alignment of all world rea reality with the character of God is fundamental to the Christian faith, but it's, I think, fundamental to other world religions as well. Um, now, some of you may be uh, a little bit skeptical about these six features that I have given. M my argument here is not so much that all adherents of world religions interpret their own particular religion in this way. My argument is that all world religions, one, can be interpreted to have these features and have been interpreted by significant representatives of those religions as having those features. This is, remember, my own Christian reading of the features of world religions. Uh, some might argue I'm importing Christian concerns into them. I would respond uh, they aren't Christian concerns, they are concerns of those religions themselves, as I can show by indicating that they are interpreters of those religions in this way. Now, it would be, this would be very important for our discussion of Islam, because some of these features you might think are, do not fit Islam as such. For instance, uh, religion as a distinct cultural system. The argument could be made that that's not the case in Islam. And the argument that I will make is that Islam has been interpreted, can be interpreted, and originally can be authentically interpreted to be uh, such, understood as a distinct cultural system. Indeed, many of the reformed uh, interpretations of Islam are moving in that direction. Some of my colleagues in Bosnia are doing that, some of my colleagues in the States are doing that, and so forth. Right? So you see uh, what I'm doing. Uh, rather than describing how things are, you can always find counterexamples to what I'm saying, but I can always find counterexample to what you are, counterexample that you're giving. Right? That's the point that I'm making. Now that's connected with, a, with another feature of world religions, of religions in general. We sometimes think of them as a static things. As they, we perceive them, that's how they are. But if you think just for a moment about the history of Christianity, you will see how incredibly dynamic and developing and changing Christian faith has been over the century. If you step out of Switzerland and Europe and look at the world, you will see how incredibly diverse world Christianity is, so that some people think, in terms of world Christianities. So it's not that anything goes and anything is possible. Um, uh, my work has been influenced by, by the work of sociologist David Martin, who used to teach in London School of Economics. 
And in the one book that is, I think, undeservedly very little read, and the title of the, his book is Does Christianity Cause Violence? In that book, he has a, an argument that Christian faith, other religions as well, are kind of repertoires of motifs that in different situations can be played up or played down in different ways. So it's not that anything can be played from these motifs, right? You have a certain parameters within which development can happen to be authentic and not heretical with regard to the religion, but plurality of ways in which to play Christianity, understand in the sense of like an orchestra play, plays some music, plurality of ways in which to play Christianity are possible and are also in fact legitimate. As we see very well, I think, throughout the history, Christianity, compare Eastern and Western Christianity and the versions uh, of it, you see that immediately. The same, I think, is true of other religions, and the, the dynamism continues even today. Even what it is today, it's not static. In fact, today, it's probably changing as fast as it ever has. Okay, now, that's, uh, that's uh, just to orient you in terms of how I understand world uh, religions, these uh, key features. Now to the four major uh, sections of my lecture, growth, numerical growth of religions or vitality, political assertiveness, relationship between religion and state, and religion and economy. So let's look first at the growth of religions. Now measuring global, global religious adherence is not an exact science. The figures in various surveys don't match. The best that I, can come up, I could come up with looks something like this. Or the main thesis is that religions have grown, world religions have grown both in relative and in absolute terms. Let me give you the numbers first. Tracked between absolute numbers, right, of religious adherence. Tracked between 1970 and 2005. Now that's 35 years. Keep in mind when I give you the numbers, it's absolutely staggering. Buddhists in that period have grown from 233 million to 379 million. Christians, from 1.2 billion to 2.1 billion in 35 years. Hindus, from 463 million to 870 million. Jews, smallest growth, from 17 to 15, from 14 to 15 million, and Muslims, the most staggering growth, from 554 million to 1.3 billion. Now, world religions have continued to grow since 2005, especially Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam. And by 2030, the Muslim population of the planet is expected to reach 2.2 billion, for instance. Now, a lot of it is due to uh, population growth, but nonetheless, absolute numbers are extraordinary, and especially for uh, people living in Europe, even people living in the United States, the, it, it's, it's hardly believable uh, what growth of religions, um, what growth religions have had. Now, during the same period, the number of adherents of those religions grew also in relative terms, from 67.8% of the world population to 72.4% of the world population. According to some estimates, 80% of living human beings believe in God. Now, that leaves quite a few of those who consider themselves convinced atheists or maybe somewhat more vaguely non-religious, a term that generally includes those who think of themselves as spiritual. And it's kind of fuzzy then how the categories are divided because you can be very much religious and spiritual, not belonging to a particular religious group, and then you are just spiritual but not part of a group membership but not included in the numbers that I have just given. In 
And there are but maybe 1.1 billion non-religious people in this sense in the world. That's a lot of people, <laughs> right? So it's not a minority, but at the same time, their number, though significant and growing, in fact, is decreasing as a percentage of world population, right? So there is a relative growth of world religions with regard to non-religious uh, people, as well, of course, as this staggering growth in absolute numbers. Now, some people believe that religions are growing despite globalizations. Globalization, some people think that globalization is secularizing force, and that's hardly believable. In many cases, actually, religions are growing and strengthening because of the tools that the globalization provides. Just think of the use of uh, contemporary means of communication, whether it's TV, whether it's Twitter. I don't know how many followers does Dalai Lama have. Pope Francis has a huge number of uh, followers and so forth, right? So the, 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 the use of mass media is very significant by religions and partly contributes to growth. Also, I know there will be a, um, uh, a section of discussion of uh, religion and migration. Migration is significantly enough contributing to revitalization of religion. Sociologists have studied that quite, for quite a bit because many people have claimed that if you have pluralistic societies as a result of migration, that their beliefs will actually be attenuated, that they will believe less strongly. Early on, I will talk about it tomorrow, Peter Berger has argued for that thesis. It's proven not to be the case. In new host countries, religion needs to articulate themselves. They're not just a given with the environment in which they find themselves. Religious people need to articulate themselves, and therefore, religions are in fact strengthening their, uh, their allegiance. Uh, religious people have stronger religious allegiance, more articulated uh, religious uh, allegiance, rather than the other way around. Now, I'm not reporting this as a um, kind of result of a, of a race between secularism and, uh, and religions. I'm uh, more giving this as an illustration of abiding significance of religions in the context of globalization processes. They have for centuries shaped the lives of people. They will continue to do so in foreseeable future. Now let's look at um, public assertiveness now of religions. Religions today are not just a force in people's private lives. As the presence of religious figures in media suggests, religions are also forced in a public sphere. Only a few decades ago, it was seemingly different. Religion seemed to be, in many parts of the world, much more private, more a presence in individual and communal lives than a force in public sphere. A uh, recent 2011, um, a book called God's Century has appeared. Resurgent Religion and Global Politics is the subtitle of this, religion, of this book. And they summarize their findings. I quote, over the past four decades, religion's influence on politics has reversed its decline and become powerful on every continent and across every major religion. Earlier confined to the home, to the family, to the village, the mosque, synagogue, temple, church, religions ha religion has come to exert its influence in parliaments, presidential palaces, lobbyist offices, campaigns, military training camps, negotiation rooms, protest rallies, city squares, and dissident ja jail cells. Workplace increasingly is a site of prayer room, uh, of prayer, and small groups are present um, within its confines. Clearly, now religion wasn't forced to go outside, right, into the public sphere. They went to the public sphere on their own, though often with the help of shrewd politicians. For instance, moral majority movement in the United States 
was only partly motiva uh, uh, motivated internally by religious concerns. It was actually orchestrated by the Republican Party. So in many cases, there was a kind of symbiotic relationship between political power and the resurgence of religion in, on the public scene. But still, for most world religions, religion is not simply a private matter. A private religion is truncated, limited religion. Kind of the nerve center, you can say, of a world religion are the hearts of individuals. But the domain of influence of a religion is entire world. Religions structure relationships between people. They craft cultures. They don't merely shape interior lives of people or maybe their private communal uh, expression of their faith. Now that's true, as I mentioned earlier, not just of Islam, which is obvious, or of Christianity, which is also has been historically obvious, but it's true also of Buddhism, a religion, if there is any, of personal enlightenment. But many Buddhists today think of themselves as having public, political responsibility. So do Hindus, as the example of Mahatma uh, Gandhi attests, and various Hindu precept, precepts can be, uh, can be uh, invoked to prove that. Or today's Indian politics, I think, is a, is a very good example of it. But, you know, religious prophetic impulse, world religious prophetic impulse, would not have sufficed to push religions into public sphere and to be, for them to become as assertive politically as they are. Globalization helped as well just as it helped in the numerical growth. Um, Anthony Giddens, um, sociologist uh, at London School of Economics, has argued in Runaway World that the advances in global communications have significantly influenced the spread of democracy. And democracy is the most powerful energizing idea of the 20th century. As the democratic ideal conquered the world, now the door opened for religions to take space to which they saw themselves as properly belonging. Um, American sociologist Jose Casanova has argued that democratization of politics carried on the wings of globalization processes has contributed to political assertiveness of religions. And you can see that the main reason is very simple. If religions embrace democracy, if religious people embrace democracy, and if they live in democratic setting, obviously they will want to bring their visions of the good life to bear on political events. The more robust democracy you have, more assertiveness of, uh, and more vibrant religions are, the more assertive religions you will, be, uh, you will get. You will not be able simply to limit religions to public, uh, to, to private sphere. And I think it's for this reason in the next lecture I will talk about um, political pluralism and religious exclusivism. For this reason, it is particularly important for us to be attuned to the concerns of political pluralism because we will have multiple religions inhabiting the same space each one of them politically assertive and will have that if religions are vibrant and if they embrace democratic ideal, which of both of things are true. Now, this conjoining of democracy and religion seems counterintuitive to many people. Many people think that somehow uh, religions are anti-democratic. Democracy, the line of reasoning goes, is about agency of ordinary people, about honoring their diverse perspective, perspectives about letting them shape public life. Religions, people suggest, in contrast, are about immutable precepts taken from ancient texts, about one truth for all people and all times. Now, the claim that world religions and democracy are incompatible is, I think, completely mistaken. Uh, you take monotheism and then you can see that the rule of one God 
can have two effects on politics, not just one. And you can give many examples in the history of that. It can have both authoritarian effect and it can have democratizing e effects. One god can serve to underwrite the rule of one king, one ruler, but one god can serve to, to, uh, to uh, underwrite the power of the entire people. And you see the emergence of the kingdom, kingship in Israel, this was precisely the argument. When Israel wanted to have king, they wanted to be like the other nations, and God wasn't terribly pleased by that. One God was to be associated with the entirety of the people, rather mediated God's power through a particular person, particular king. Yeah. Now, today, the great majority of monotheists, Muslims included, and I will say, talk about it a little bit more, um, are, uh, are endorsing the second option, very much democratically minded. So some people immediately think counterexample is Islam. Muslims are reputed to be prone to authoritarianism. If you think of uh, Benedict XVI's Regenburg's address, it was built around the contrast precisely in those terms. The God of will, uh, which is uh, Allah, uh, gives foundation for non-democratic authoritarian forms of regime. I think that's a mistaken argument, actually, on many, on many levels. We can talk about it when I give a lecture on, on Islam. But according to two, uh, 2013 Pew poll, the majority of world Muslims prefer democracy to a strong leader, except in South Asia, where only 45% do. The, an overwhelming majority of all Muslim, Muslims embrace religious freedom, with percentages ranging from 85% in the Middle East to, and North Africa to 97% in South Asia. Now, you may think about, you can discuss what exactly religious freedom means, and I'll come to that right away. But those are very interesting and important figures. For Muslims, as for many religious people, as well as non-religious people, the difficulty isn't to embrace democracy. The difficulty is to embrace pluralistic form of democracy. <laughs> That's the big difficulty. That's the huge challenge. And I'll try to address this in my, in my next, uh, next lecture. And I will argue that pluralistic democracy and world religions are compatible as well, not just democracy and world religions. Right? So under the condition of globalization, religions are alive, they're growing, and they're publicly assertive religions are in no way disappearing, as some people have suggested that they would. But religions are changing, and they're changing sometimes in significant ways. Um, we can identify those, those changes. For instance, there's a change from positional authority to charismatic authority, and that goes hand in hand with mass, mass media. Um, you have authority and democratization of politics as well. You have authority because you are perceived as having authority, because you do some good to people. You can manage to project your power, but it's not yours simply on account of the position that you have. Um, obviously, a position matters, as we can see in the uh, institution of pa papacy, or as you can see it also with somebody like Dalai Lama. His institutional role matters, but it's charismatic power that also has a significant role, an increasingly important role. And that's clear also in more democratic, democratically structured religions. Islam is such democratic structure religion, so that official authority matters less than authority of a charismatic figure that can be now worldwide. For instance, in Christianity, it's similar. So uh, Rick Warren, an evangelical leader, has no positional authority except in the church that he has founded. But he has immense world authority on account of quote-unquote per charismatic personality that his people find useful, but he is offering to them. This kind of shifts in the nature of religions uh, are going to, going to continue to, uh, to happen. Other such changes are also uh, easily predictable. I want to concentrate the remain, remainder of my time 
to two very significant changes uh, that are associated closely with globalization. And one of these concerns the relation of religions to state, and the other one concerns relation of religion to economy. Now, I leave aside uh, another third very important change of religion, and that concerns uh, environment. That is also underfoot. Uh, a shift from exclusive concentration of humanity as, uh, as, uh, uh, to a concentration on the planet as a whole, on creation in Christian terms. Uh, in introductory comment, uh, mentioned uh, evangelicals and fundamentalists in the United States with their apocalyptic expectations were mentioned in this regard. Now that was certainly true in the 70s, that you had uh, and some really high position of power uh, evangelicals who had zero concern for, for the environment. It has shifted in the last 20 years. Uh, recently, evangelicals have been on the forefront of cre what, they call, what we call creation care, right? Just because of the concern that um, uh, the, the, for God's creation as God's creation rather than simply as object that is simply, is simply there for us. So those kinds of shifts are present. Uh, I will concentrate here on relationship between religion and state and religion and economy. Now, I think globalization, as I suggested, is changing relationship of world religions to the state. When a religious community is coextensive with the society, <clears throat> religion can serve to integrate a society and provide its government with legitimizing ideology. For those of you who are students of sociology, you can have something like Durkheimian account of religion, relationship with religion and, and the community. With globalization processes, that changes. Whereas before, religion, moral self-understanding of individuals and society, and state, that is to say religion, moral self-understanding of society and the state or government can align and then integrate the, uh, the, the political society. Now that's becoming less and less possible. Um, by the way, Christian, uh, example from Christian scripture of this kind of alignment of religion, moral self-understanding and political legitimacy, you can see that in King David. This is why According to biblical story, he brought the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant from Kiryat Yerim to Jerusalem. He brought it to Jerusalem to establish Jerusalem as a city, uh, as a city which is a religious, cultural, and political center of his kingdom. So you have to unity between religion, moral self-understanding, and the uh, state. I have to have a drink. Now we can, <clears throat> we can use a term for this, political religions. I don't mean by that politically engaged religions, but religions which are by their nature political. The right? uh, term political religion has been used in political philosophy uh, in different, different ways. Nazism, for instance, was deemed to be political religion. But religions can function also just as such political religions. Now, that's possible if you have a homo relatively homogeneous society. But if you have multiple religions or multiple varieties of the same religion coexisting within the boundaries of a society, no individual religion can articulate and celebrate that link of political society and transcendent order. You no longer are able to have this Durkheimian account of relationship between religion and society. After Protestant Reformation introduced the fissure into Latin Christianity, for instance, belonging to the state was gradually decoupled from adhering to a specific religion or a specific version of it. There are ob obviously attempts to revive that, but they have progressively, I think, failed just on account of this internal difference. 
Progressive globalization, marked as it is by unprecedented flow of commerce, ideas, and peoples, more importantly, across national border, borders, is transforming mono-religious societies into societies with multiple forms of religion and our religion coexisting side by side. This is Europe today, this is America for many, uh, of many, oh, many years. The connection between a given religion and political society is weakening, I believe, everywhere. And in some nations, it is altogether non-existent. In the United States, you had for a while something that uh, Robert Bella has called civil religion. It's almost like a Christianity light, <laughs> abstract transcendence that united uh, Christians and, and Jews together under the single kind of sacred uh, canopy. That too is slowly losing its, uh, its, its power because uh, the country as such is too diverse. Partly secularly, um, secularism is stronger, partly other religions are present as well. Now, in reaction to these kinds of tendencies of globalization, you, um, uh, and, and partly also in reaction to sexual, sexual sec secular nationalisms, movements are underfoot in all world religions to strengthen their connection with political order. Maybe Turkey is a very good example. Uh, today, other uh, Islamic countries might be also given um, as an example. But many Buddhists, for instance, in Sri Lanka, now also in Myanmar, are fighting to keep together the religion of Buddha and their particular culture in one um, and function as political religions today. Sri Lankan example I know better and it's very, very interesting how, I'll talk about it uh, on the third day, how this kind of religion of personal enlightenment becomes a political religion in Sri Lanka, right? Because it associates itself with, a, with the power that be. Religious Zionists in, uh, have uh, believed that Jewish religion and the state of Israel are inseparable. Some people in the United States, representatives of the Christian right, believe that the United States ought to seek to reestablish close ties between Christian faith and U.S. national identity. Political Islam is probably the best example of this counter-tendency to what I have been describing. In Milestone, Syed Qutb, a prominent intellectual representative of political Islam, sums up his program by explaining that the most basic Muslim conviction, there is no God but God, means no other sovereignty except God's. Sovereignty, no law except God's. No authority of one man over another as the authority in all respects belongs to God. Right? So you've got this program of political uh, Islam, I think, as a counter reaction to uh, what is happening uh, in, in the world in terms of pluralization of political spaces as well as uh, kind of sometimes secularizing influences. Now, I personally think that attempts to, for religions to assert dominance and exercise integrative function in political society is mistaken. It's profoundly mistaken. First, history teaches that aspired dominance almost inevitably turns into actual subservience. It's never, the rationale is always, oh, if we are close to the power, of political power, we'll be able to shape the political power. What happens, in fact, instead of shaping political power, religions end up being used as tools uh, by the political power. Uh, American conservative evangelicals have experienced that in many, in many ways. For instance, the, the, uh, uh, the agenda, anti-abortion agenda or uh, gay marriage kind of uh, agenda has not been pushed forward by, by any of the, of the Republican presidents for whom uh, most evangelicals, conservative evangelicals have voted. And I think evangelicals have been used by the powers that be just as the moral majority of movement has been created by the powers that be. So that, that's a significant observation. And I think, uh, at least but, uh, according to what I read, it holds true uh, throughout uh, history and in most of the places in the world today. So then the second point, first point is um, 
aspire dominance turns into subver subservience. The second point is um, world religions pay for this bad bargain, right? They bargain for influence but uh, end up being subservient. They pay for that by loss of identity. As I interpret them, world religions are cultural systems distinct from governments and they form transcultural, transnational communities, marking boundaries, ethnocultural boundaries, integrating political entities, legitimizing governments is not what these religions are basically about, or it not to be what these religions are basically about. At least not as conceived by Buddha, Confucius, Jesus, or even Muhammad in some way, at least in his early period. They address human beings qua human beings and therefore transcend ethnocultural boundaries and introduce actually fissures into political societies. Now that may be, I mean, I come from Croatia, as you, as you know. Uh, I lived, I grew up in Serbia. There you had Orthodoxy and Catholicism both employed in some ways as, a politi as political uh, religions in very pro problematic ways. Not to say that world religions don't, do not do that, but I think they betray their basic identity when they do. Because religions address human beings qua human beings. Everyone is addressed by the transcendent call. They apply the same moral code to insiders and outsiders, and therefore fundamentally are motivated to build bridges between insiders and outsiders. They seek to align mundane reality with transcendent norms, and therefore are Consist, ought to be at least consistently, as Karl Barth has mentioned, unreliable allies. If religion is an unreliable ally to politics, it isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, would be my argument. So when they see themselves as expressing the moral unity of nation and furnishing political order with sacred aura, world religions distort themselves and betray one of their signature features, the alignment of individual, universal values, and of religion. And finally, in those kinds of situations, religions end up underwriting violence. I will, I will make an argument in lecture day after tomorrow that that's the main place where religions promote violence, may reason why religions promote violence. Alignment with powers, powers that be. Now, with regard to world religion's relation to society and state, and state, globalization is religion's friend, not religion's enemy. Now, that's a very controversial thesis. I, I, I had an uproar once when I articulated this thesis in, the, in a smaller group around the, uh, around the table. By ge generating multi-religious societies, globalization offers world religions an opportunity to return to themselves, to be the means of embracing a cosmopolitan God, to use Nietzsche's terms, a God for everyone at home everywhere, a God impartial to friend and foe, to be carriers of universal visions of human flourishing, distinct from any particular political society and relating to all people as human beings, whether they are political insiders or outsiders. Now, I think strong tendency to see themselves in those terms are present in all world religions. You will again probably think, well, Islam might be or is an exception. And in many places, Islam is an exception to this. Other religions are um, Hinduism. Certain forms of Hinduism in India certainly are also uh, an exception. I tend to follow the argument of Olivier Roy in his book, Globalized Islam. I'm not sure exactly what uh, um, French original is. 
He suggests that the majority of world's Muslim, Muslims live today in religiously pluralistic societies. In countries where Muslims are the majority, the Muslim population is often divided among rival versions of Islam. And in some places, non-Muslims form significant and powerful minorities. Notwithstanding the recent establishment of the Caliphate, Islamic State, which most influential Muslim leaders that I know think is neither Islamic nor a state, but be that as it may, the gradual Islamization, so, so notwithstanding recent establishment of Caliphate and gradual Islamization of other states, maybe Turkey is a good example, I'm not sure, Islam's link to specific territories is progressively being severed. Islam is, as Olivier Roy has argued, deterritorializing, and that's the fundamental uh, thing. If that's true, if Islam is fundamentally deterritorializing, I think it will change the character uh, as of its relations to politics. In this situation, political Islam, with its goal of establishing a state based on Islamic law, is gradually becoming implausible. And not surprisingly, many people today embrace Islam as a universal religion of a transnational community and whose center is individual appropriation of religion. That's uh, indicative, say, uh, in popularity of Sufi Islam uh, would be an indication of something of that. Again, I'm aware this is a controversial uh, thesis. Uh, we'll have time to uh, discuss this. Let me make a few comments before the end on the relationship between religion and economy. Now, with regard to religion's relation to political society and rule, uh, religion is moving, uh, 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 globalization is moving religions closer to their vision. In relation to their, in regard to their relation to, uh, to economy, it's moving them away, I think, from original relig uh, religion vision. I think the tendency of many of uh, world religions today, Christianity probably most clearly, is to turn religion into a prosperity religion. Remember the other one was political religions? Now there's something like prosperity religion. There is such a term in Christian terms as, in, in Christian faith, as prosperity gospel. Uh, prosperity religion is religion functionalized with regard to serving um, religion's relation to health, wealth, longevity, and fertility. Now, some people are very familiar with Max Weber's thesis that um, Protestantism has contributed to rise of capitalism. Whether it's true or not, I think there's some truth to that. But even in that context, the idea was subservience of the economic realm to the transcendent realm. Gradually, I think, this is disappearing. And interestingly enough, in Christian circles, this is disappearing not only in more conservative, but also in the more liberal uh, uh, branches of, of Christianity. In the more conservative, you have something like prosperity gospel, and you have a, kind of as an extreme example. An extreme example would be, I think, there, I'm not sure exactly what, the na what his name is. I'll have to look at my foot footnotes. I think Anzioni or somebody like that, who talked about this divine transfer of wealth from the uh, ungodly to the godly, if they just believe and give their tithes to the, um, to the, to the uh, minister uh, in, in question, right? So, so you have a sense that the purpose of faith is somehow to increase your, your wealth, obviously to give you health, longevity, and so forth. So the religion ends up being functionalized. I've heard it from the other side uh, as well. Uh, now it's associated less with miraculous intervention and conservative uh, economics, but more with a kind of political, uh, politically progressive economics, where then uh, really the purpose of religion is to make everyone actually have a swimming pool and not just some, right? So it's, uh, but, but you see how religion ends up being functionalized then in terms of what kinds of prosperity 
needs we end up uh, having. Academically inclined religious advocates of free market are keen, for instance, to show that religions have resources essential for the smooth and efficient functioning of the market and economy. Uh, market economy needs virtues, and we can provide. It needs trust, discipline, work, and hope, and religions supply those things, and entirety is functionalized into success. Now, my thesis is not this is uh, that faith has no positive effects upon ordinary life, right? That point of my previous lecture is to show that, in fact, it does, but it may not be functionalized, take what is prior to be subservient to where... Um, to the mundane concerns. And I think if I see a concern in the world religion, then I see concern for Christianity is increasing functionalization of the Christian faith with regard to the socially mediated visions of the good life uh, that we experience in whatever society we find ourselves. Then our health, our wealth, our longevity matters more to us than adherence to the one God. Obsession with health is absolutely stunning um, if I look at the younger generation in the United States. So it is, you'll be surprised in the United States, obsession with health food, right? Foodies are really, and I'm one of them, right? I exercise regularly in the gym as well. But the kind of this fundamental inversion of the, of the faith as being about ordinary realities, I think undermines actual enjoyment and value of ordinary realities themselves. Globalization is pushing us there, and we ought to resist in the name of faith and in the name of flourishing of our societies. Thank you.